bowel obstruction patient, if you look at the top of your handout, it says there's two reasons why it could happen. It could be mechanical. I want you to write bowel impaction. I want you to write, um, I want you to write cancer. The old tumor in there is gonna stop everything. So from mechanical tumor, cancer, or bowel impaction. Okay, good. Now, paralytic ileus, look at the word, shit. Ileus is actually part of what body part? Is it large or small? Small intestine, and what part? The third part, we talked about that. It's at the end as it goes into the large intestine. Professor Good, you know your anatomy. Okay, this ileus, is it moving? It's paralyzed, paralytic. Why is it paralyzed? Well, put in your notes, P for paralytic ileus, P for post-op patient. The most common patients that get a paralytic ileus are post-ops and pancreatitis, PPP. Paralytic ileus, P for pancreatitis, P for post-op, PPP. Now, the patients who are shunting blood away from the arms and the legs and to the brain and the heart can also get a paralytic ileus. So that would be your shock patients, that would be your DIC patients, we'll talk about that later. But you just need to understand that that is where we're going to shut down your blood flow when we are going to have a shock patient. You don't need blood in our digestive system. The chances of me giving you spaghetti when you're in shock are slim. So you're not going to need it. So we shut the blood away on purpose. So it's a paralytic ileus. Now, paralytic ileus, number one, number one lab to monitor is going to be potassium. When potassium is low, as in all post-op patients, then your patient is at risk for bowel obstruction. So your job, nurses, is to walk in the room of your post-op patient, and I have already told y'all how many times, I don't know, that it's important to do rounds. Nothing is more important than rounding on the patient, checking a quick physical assessment, making sure the answers are alive, because you got some trifling nurses out here, and I can tell you at least three hospitals in the area, damn patient was dead from anywhere from four to eight hours. And the chick charted all on it the whole time so that the AIDS, trifling AIDS, trifling nurses fall together. Okay, so you want to make sure you do rounds. When you walk in to do the rounds of a post-op patient, oh, you got some quickie assessments to do. They call it targeted assessment based on what are you there for. So you already know what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to look at the vital signs, hope that our aid didn't make them up because 50% of them do and we need to know that. Now, if the vital signs make sense, because if they don't, you're going to do them over. If they make sense, we can move on to listening to the heart and lungs. We listen to lungs and heart at the same damn time, don't we all? Keep it moving. Listen to those bowel sounds. When we listen to the bowel sounds, with an obstruction, the higher the obstruction, the faster the patient will have symptoms. So with a bowel obstruction, when you go to listen to every single quadrant using the belly button as a landmark, left upper, up, right upper, all that shit. When you go to do that, the obstruction is above, usually wherever these bowel sounds are, they're usually above the obstruction. It says high pitch above the obstruction, and then they go silent, highlight that. High pitch above. Okay, so you want to remember that this patient is going to have bowel sounds higher up. Nothing's working up here. So they ate the food and went down the esophagus to the left, to the left, went into the small intestine, duodenum, remember that? And shit going on right there. Now let's look at what happens when you're stuck on Twitter with the stuff. You walk in the room, you do the assessment. You also check them their reflexes and a do on that that po uh gonna get the pedal pulse and see what hurts. A nice little hookup for you as a real nurse. Those are all the things I do on everybody. No matter I don't give a shit what it is that they're there for. Okay, so anyway, here we go. You walk in the room, you got the funky ass bowel sounds. You say to the patient, and you embarrass the shit out of them because they man and shit sitting there. Sweetheart, are you passing any gas? And she turns red and looks all crazy. Um, yeah. Cool, leave her alone. Uh no. Red flag. She's not passing flatus or gas, right? She's got to know both words. Flatulence, flatus, gas. She's not passing any gas. Okay, well, that's a problem because if you're post-op and your surgical um, procedure that you have goes well, 
your bowel activity should return, which means everything's moving. Ain't nothing moving if you're not passing gas. So that's a problem, that's a red flag. The second thing that you are um, concerned about, she says she's not even burping, which is eructation. She's not passing gas, she's not passing. nothing's moving. What are you gonna do at that point if you're smart? You're gonna hold her breakfast. Because bowel sounds should return, here we go, within six hours. Bowel sounds should return within six hours. So your first nursing action is NPO. Now, when you were doing your abdominal assessment, you noticed that her belly looked a little distended. If you're early in the process, it'll just be slightly distended. You're going to touch it, she might say, ah, yeah, that didn't feel good. It wasn't excruciating, but it just didn't feel good. It's kind of tight like a balloon. And this is more news, this is more evidence. A good nurse checks for the potassium right at that point. Baby, let me check your labs. Now, the problem is, and it happens all the time, when I go check the labs, ain't none. Got to pull a resident, have them do a CMP or BMP. I would just do a BMP for this one. So how do you do a BMP so you can get a potassium? Because you ain't calling the doctor yet, are you? Now you need more information. Because what can happen is that the potassium is low, and we can just give a little bit of potassium chloride, and it'll make everything move again, okay? Now, you gotta know why the potassium is low. When you're a post-op patient, we told you NPO after midnight, remember? Of course, for you and me, you and me, that means we ate ribs, wings, and pizza at 11.59 p.m., didn't we? Okay, but no, these are old people, okay? A lot of these people are old people, and what did the old people do? They ate dinner at five o'clock, and they watched the six o'clock news, and they went to bed promptly by eight, because they had surgery in the morning. That's old folks all over the nation. So technically, they didn't eat till 5 p.m. Doesn't that make sense? Because you ain't got no food, and I didn't have a tray of spaghetti wing on your ass, lobster and shit, after the surgery, I did not. Okay, so I kept a little bit with the clear liquids and that sort of thing. So you never really took in any potassium. Okay, then the second problem is you gave a patient some opiates, didn't you? It's called uh, codeine, it's called demerol, it's called morphine, it's called phenol. Whatever you did, you gave a patient some, some, some narcotic pain relievers called opiates. Anesthesia gave them opiates, said no for sure. And maybe even propofol. Who the hell knows? But they gave them drugs that stopped the digestive system. If they had a bowel prep, you clean the shit out of their digestive system. One nothing in there, no way. So you purposely clean them, and all GI surgeries have a bowel prep. So you have all these reasons why there's no potassium in this patient. We are not done. When you had surgery, you lost something called red blood cells. Potassium's in every single cell. You lost it. It's in the canister, in the OR. That's where your little potassium is in the damn cancer. So blood loss loses the potassium. You have every reason to look for a bottle obstruction in all post-op patients. Okay? Now, so you did the damn thing. You walked in the room. You did the physical assessment. Shit consistent with a bottle obstruction. You have some abdominal distension. Patients are uncomfortable. I feel like I gotta go. They think they're constipated. They may or may not be because there's maybe nothing in there except whatever they have had so far. Then they uh, tell you they're not passing any gas. You're smart. You make them NPO. Every now and then, the nurse before you was stuck on stupid and parked on dumb. If that's true, then you're going to get late signs. She ain't even checking her patients. She might not even get a physical assessment. I got a lot of them out there like that. They ain't mine because I kill them. So my husband is sleeping. Let me know whenever you see one of mine acting up because I'll call them right on their little cell phone. I heard you out here acting the ass and got my name in your mouth. Crazy. I had to call one. She's doing fraud. I said, I'll report to myself. Charting what she didn't do. I'll report to myself because you learned from me. Okay? So you got this patient. Late signs mean that your nurse was trifling, did not heed the call of not passing flaters, uh, hyperactive bowel sounds below the obstruction, abdominal distension, wasn't even talking to the patient out there selling Girl Scout cookies at the desk. Whatever. They're not really on top of it. Here's your late sign. Look at the top on the left. Your patient is throwing up now. And your patient is throwing up something that smells like poop. We've had nurses that didn't realize their anatomy say, my patient's throwing up shit. Sweetheart, that's impossible. 
Ain't nobody gonna throw up no damn shit. Because shit is way down here in your butt. Now how the hell did what's down here in your butt work this way up all the way out your mouth? I don't know. So you're not gonna sound stupid like that. But what's really happening is it smells like poop. Here's why. And this is what you get when you screw this up. When you screw this patient up, it's ugly. And let's do our little patient. We're just gonna pretend like this is a small intestine and stretch it out, y'all, all right? Your patient has the beginning of a bowel obstruction. We'll say a paralytic ileus. I put that there to demonstrate very slow movement. This is kind of like the area where some stuff is stuck. All right. Okay, here we go. Breakfast. Nurse is stuck on stupid, feeds her patient. Here comes breakfast. Still reversible. Day shift nurse, flirting with the resident, trying to get a freak on, ain't paying attention. Here's what her, her patient's gonna do with lunch. Dinner time comes, you work a seven to seven, seven P to seven A, dinner time nurse, still the same daytime nurse. Now she done freaking with the resident. Now she's just trying to catch up on Facebook. So she let the aide give the patient dinner. She ain't assessed shit. Because if she did, this patient would be distended. They might be in tears from the discomfort, but patients are crazy. They don't eat whatever you put in front of them. Here you come. Your aide tells you that this patient is not feeling that great. The nurse's report goes a little something like this. Well, you know, you might want to watch him. He looks like he's been getting more uncomfortable throughout the day. That was the extent of her asshole report. So you go in there and you go and such and do rounds right at seven. We're throwing up fecal, as your shirt, as your uh, handout says, fecal smelling emesis. That's exactly what's happening. All of this hot ass mess is coming up. It's coming up. And because you had bean bats before you, your patient needs a bowel resection and a permanent colostomy for the rest of their life. Because of a nurse. This is not a doctor issue. This is a nurse's issue. So this patient will get a permanent colostomy because you waited too long. If you had caught it at breakfast, even maybe at lunch, potassium would have made everything move out of the way. Within about, I don't know, four to eight hours, it's fast. It works out really fast. Patients gotta hit their guts because you made them MPO and they have to stay MPO. They don't have an NG and there's no worse procedure than an NG. Putting an NG down really is rude, <laughs> but you gotta do it. Because we want gastric decompression. We don't want this. So far so good? Okay, that was it. Next is peritonitis, which is the next page. Hot belly syndrome. Hot belly is what we all call it. Uh, we think the patient in room four has a hot belly. That's what we call it. Now, peritonitis, which you can tell by your handout, the patient can have all kinds of reasons why they have a peritonitis. The most common reasons, all GI is dirty, and anything wrong in the GI department is going to give you a dirty bowel. And the dirty bowel things that you can think of, pancreatitis, you have to think about uh, perforations, all give you peritonitis. Anything that perforates is going to give you a peritonitis. Uh, even a ruptured ectopic pregnancy will give you a peritonitis. So it's absolutely crazy, it's just dirty bowel syndrome. Now, this patient with this dirty bowel syndrome, if you look at it, our little rhyme about IV, NG, Foley, surgery, our little rhyme is pretty much on this page. So let's look at what we got. We got IV. You'll see it's in his right cephalic vein. If you follow the IV, what do you think the little uh, piggyback is? Look at the picture. Antibiotics. 
What's next to it? So a maintenance bag, isotonic solutions, right? Isotonic is normal saline and LI. Okay, so we get our IV. He has an NG, doesn't he? Okay, the NG is for gastric decompression. In this case, we don't like it. What's going in his NG looking like? Blood, isn't it? Okay, you don't want no blood in the NG. Blood is an NG, call somebody yesterday.